you hear me? Or? Yeah, there it is, the echo. Uh, and the lights can it dim a little bit because those over there are a bit bright for me. But um, thank you very much for all coming here today, and uh, well, for the whole concert, of course. Uh, I think everybody is enjoying the hell out of it uh, with all the lounge parties and the whiskey drinking. And I was in bed this morning at six, so that was. Uh, and then I still had to do my slides this afternoon with a hangover, so that's funny. Anyway, so it seems that several people said they were not here for Security Nightmare, so you actually came for my talk, I guess, then. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, because this turnout, I, I've been in halls, like at ITF meetings and so on. We had like 1,500 um, sort of professional internet providers and people who know the tech in a room, but. How many are in here? Like 3K? It's scary. Well, anyway, as uh, you probably read on the, inter on the wiki page on the, on the project announcement, um, we have a, a little uh, test where we uh, will be collecting some information, and I'll be talking about this now. Is there something going on there, back there? Oh. Anyway, so as everybody probably knows, a, um, the internet consists out of several interconnected networks. So you have all these little clouds, and you, as your computer, you attach it somewhere to one of these clouds. So, like when you arrived here from a different country, most likely, or well, most I guess most people are Germany. But when I arrived here and I started typing something, Google suddenly Google realized, like, hey, you're not in Switzerland anymore. So do you want to move all your data to Germany? So then I would move to the other side of the clouds. Um, and most of these clouds are sort of autonomously operated, like here in Germany you have Deutsche Telekom, which operates the DSL network, and you have well, various others, uh, Speed Partner, and I don't know what, um, who operate a network. These networks are all separate, and these networks under the, well, the internet are called autonomous systems. And they have their own traffic policies, they determine themselves who they connect with, how they exchange traffic information, and so on. So generally, you connect to one place on this big cloud, which we then together call the internet. And one of these clouds is what you call an autonomous system. So generally, though, what you connect to this network for is that you want to connect to either a service or you want to be able to communicate with a friend somewhere else on the internet. And in a lot of cases, they might be local because they have the same ISP with you as you, or they're somewhere on the other side of the world uh, connected far, far away. And if you then look what is actually happening, your packets are being sent over the internet, and I made it sort of simple now. So my packets go over the clouds nicely above and then down to the, to the service, which I'm accessing, whatever service that is, if that is a Facebook, a Google, a Twitter, I don't know what, uh, your favorite porn site, probably. And <laughs> I mean, that's where the internet is for, right? So <laughs> hey, <laughs> uh, this is a very simple ver version, because in a way, actually, when these networks all talk to each other, your packets will not always move over the same path. Basically, what is happening, every network is attracting their packets. So you say like, oh, I know where this destination is. That network, the next cloud, will attract these packets, and so on. The way back might be completely different. But for the simplification, we just assume that the packets are symmetrically crossing the network, because that makes it much more understandable to, for this experiment. Um, now, in these networks, all these ISPs generally have a system in place, which I will be discussing about. Um, for that matter, Nick didn't mention it, but if you have questions, yell, walk to the mic, or yell for one of the angels. Um, so most of these networks have already in place, uh, either because of government mandate, um, because of tapping laws, equipment, which will be activated on judge order, or generally for more accounting purposes or abuse tracking, they will have systems in place which are logging basically the same thing as your phone records. Um, the, well, the call records in a way, which I'll come into a little bit. And these are these eyes. And depending on where you put an eye in the network, that is the amount of information that you will see. 
uh, from such a service provider. So if you are a very big internet provider, like an entity or a uh, level three or something, you will see, or Google for that matter, you will have eyes all over the world. So you will see a lot more traffic and what people will be doing. If you're a small ISP, you will probably only see your local internet users and not anybody else. But the guys in the middle, so those clouds in the middle, those what we call transit providers, they generally see almost every bit of traffic, unless it's privately exchanged between those two clouds directly. So some quick notes. Um, networks thus can see what they have in their network. So unless they will have an agreement with another network for exchanging this information, they will not know about it. Um, and that is uh, a good property for security and privacy, of course, because if you know that a certain network has been under surveillance from a certain entity that you do not want that, that are looking at your traffic, you have opportunities to avoid those networks, of course, by either not using them or properly encrypting your packets or relay them using, well, everybody, I guess, knows Tor and similar systems, I2P and so on. Um, and as I mentioned before, the paths are maybe most likely asymmetric. So one of the, uh, the law enforcement techniques, what is uh, used is a tap slash mirror port. But the, so what you do is you generally have fiber links. So this is optic, so you just shine light through a little piece of plastic, uh, which is costing you a lot of money. And you then splice it and you mirror it off. And that means that even if the device, which is then the collector, what I call there at the bottom, if that breaks down, because it's light, it will still keep on going. So an optical tap is a very good method for stealing or looking at network traffic without, being able, or without influencing the network itself. Um, this is used for, for instance, law enforcement. If they have a criminal investigation, they will, in most countries, and some like that uh, country where Nick is from, they will not ask, but in a lot of countries you go to a judge and you will have to get a court order. The court order goes to the ISP and the ISP will then, well, have to uh, take uh, into well have to take action and they will have to set up a tap and send all the traffic from well for instance your DSL line to the cops or whatever the investigating uh, organization is but there's so there's a huge pro in this you see every single packet you see the full packets you can then well store them and this is then again of course the big issue if you're going to tap everybody in a network uh, you will yeah, well, you run into storage issues. I'm pretty sure that my company will love to sell you tape drives, hard disk, and everything else, various other vendors too, um, but it's, it's nearly impossible. And also from the fact that later on, if you want to dive into it again and you want to look something up, it will be very difficult to actually, well, nearly impossible with the amounts of data that exist on the internet and which larger ISPs have to actually figure out what is actually going on and to find the right bits. So, I uh, describe here a little concept for the next couple of mechanisms that are being used to well, look at what you're doing on the internet. Uh, so if you have a phone call, yeah, you call from, uh, from your phone number to some other person's phone number, and at the end of the month you get this whole list uh, which basically specifies well, uh, your source phone number and then your destination phone number, uh, the amount of minutes called, and well, the amount that it costs. In IP networks, you have a similar kind of terminology, which is what they call a flow. This is specified in RFC 5101 for uh, this protocol called IPFIX, which we'll be coming into in the next couple of slides. And this basically comes down to that you normally s store or send a call record, an IP call record if you would like, uh, from a source address, source port, so you will see the client port also, to a destination port and like the port source again, I made a typo there, which would be port 80, for instance, if you are talking to a web server. And these records are like 50 bytes each, so it's much better to store than, uh, well, the full packet, which, well, per packet is 1,500 bytes, and in this case, as we're talking about the set of IP addresses, which are together, so for over a time series, so let's say you tell me, or, well, you uh, set up a web connection to Google, you, well, make a connection to port 80 on their web server, you send like 1,500 packets, you get like 3,000 back. In this call record, is described thus that you, ha well, basically, very simple, the IP source, 
the port source, uh, the destination port, and the destination IP address with those volumes. So instead of minutes, you will get the volumes of octets and packets. And uh, as I mentioned, this is only a record of 50 bytes versus what maybe you transferred like 50 megs or more. So the data storage requirements are much lower. Now, there are a couple of techniques for this, uh, which originally were more made for actually optimizing the internals of routers and switches. Uh, so Cisco came up with this protocol called NetFlow at one point, um, and they collected this sort of call records internally in the router, and then when the next packet would come in, they would match up in this table, and this would make them, at that time they thought at least, easier and faster to route the packet on to the destination that it should go to. At that point, there were a couple of Cisco guys who were like, hey, but I can also use this information to, well, sort of use this as call records. And they started exporting this information, and that is what the NetFlow protocol does. Now, there are like, um, the, well, there's version one, five, seven, eight, nine. Uh, the most commonly used version is five, but as um, everybody is moving to IPv6, I hope here, who has IPv6? Uh, wow, nice, that is. And is that native? Who has native IPv6 at home? <laughs> yeah, that works. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, Germany is doing quite well in that area, but V5 doesn't support v, uh, IPv6, uh, so version 9 does, um, which gives you uh, well, a lot more advantages. I'll show this in the next slide, what the differences are. And then we have what is called IPfix, which is the ITF standardization. Everybody, uh, well, I'll, so the ITF is the organization who standardizes the IP protocol, IPv6, SMTP, and basically most of the internet protocols. Something like BitTorrent didn't come from there, for instance. Uh, Skype is one, and there are a couple of other good examples which are heavily used. Uh, all the gaming protocols, Quake and so on, don't either. Um, and of course, IPfix also has an enterprise information element which makes a big difference with V9. Um, thus, the bigger advantage over a tap is that you have much lower data rate from the collector point, so from your router in general, to where you're collecting and storing the information. And does she also have less overhead uh, in storing this information, later analyzing and so on? Of course, you do not have the full packets, but if you're smart, you're most likely doing a TLS session or something, so you would not be able to look inside the packet anyway, so that information is pretty much useless, unless you're a three-letter acronym organization and you have enough computing power to look into this. I think Dan Bernstein left, he can explain more about that if you send him a mail. Um, so you have no packet contents, basically. Uh, what, is another, uh, what, what is a condo of this system is that the router has to keep state of all these call records. So every packet that comes in, it has to match up to a table. So if you want to, well, sort of exploit this again, you could generate so many different combinations of call records that the table runs full and then the box will fall over, which is a side effect again, of course. So NetFlow 5 is this structure. I guess most people are programmers, so they all understand this. You have a couple of 32-bit integers for IP addresses. You get the next hop address, so what is the next gateway that you're sending these packets to, which can be very useful if you're doing um, load balancing or you have to think about or you want to account for where you're going to send your traffic for. Um, and then you have all interface in out. You have the number of packets, the number of octets, when the flow started, so the first, and you, when the flow ended, the last. Um, and you have TCP flags. Uh, so if you, uh, for instance, all these people who were participating in this anonymous stuff for DDoSing, revengeful stuff, it was very simple because the TCP flags were all only showing sin and nothing else. So they were caught quite easily in, with this protocol, actually, which is one of the primary reasons that it's being used for, not the subject I'm going to talk about, actually, not for trying to detect people. NetFlow is uh, V9, IPfix is a bit more convoluted, as you can see. Um, the screenshot is a bit very small, or, well, it's a bit very small, actually, to read, I guess. <laughs> so, but if you look on the uh, IANA site, you will find all these definitions. So as you saw, V5 has like very little protocol fields and it had only V4 addresses. Um, in IPfix, you can basically specify what is called an information element. And this is a number which is registered in this huge uh, XML file. And this number then maps to something. So number four, for instance, is the IPv4 source address. Number five is the destination address. 
Um, if you want to use this protocol for exporting the number of Coke bottles uh, left in the vending machine, you define the number of Coke bottles in this thing and then the system understands it. It's, a, it's more or less a protocol for transferring statistics. So that looks a little bit more like this. So the header, it's a bit more overhead, but it's very easily parsable if you're a programmer like me. Uh, so you have what the, the dark blue part, the top, you have a version which has, uh, well, hex 10 of course in it. And then you have a template which describes the records below. So as you can see, there are basically two separate call records in here. And the first record is from the, uh, well, that's the source address, then you have the destination address, and th that format is specified above. So you send the template as an exporter once in a while, and then you just can send these static structures. And this is uh, really efficient on the collector side. It's not so efficient on the, uh, well, on the router side, which is doing the metering. So to look at the storage requirements for this, uh, which is the interesting part, of course, if you want to store, like say, um, if Deutsche Telekom, who have like what? How large is Germany? How many customers will they have? Like 20 million maybe or so? So they would have to look in the area of large ISP probably. They would have to store normally packet size, maybe something like two petabytes per day if they want to store all the full packets on their network. Um, well, with NetFlow, it's only four terabytes. And well, that's like, what, 400 bucks a day in hard disk space? So that's doable for a lot of corporations. It depends, of course, what your target is. Uh, but as you can see, the, uh, the amount of storage space required because you just store the call records, the summaries of this information is much lower than if you would store the full packets. Or if you, well, probably lo most people are familiar with TCP dump. With TCP dump, you could also specify just like the top header. And that is where S flow comes from a little bit. S flow stores sample packets. And this is what we used on the laptop, which is there, if I'm right, at the moment uh, for this experiment. Um, and you only get one out of 4,000 packets, which is being then slant to what I call the collector, and then that's being analyzed. And it contains uh, mostly an Ethernet header, an IP header, and a V6 header. And you then have to assume, unfortunately, that you have to multiply this by, well, the sampling rate, because you only get 4, 000, uh, one out of 4,000 packets. So if you are a proper attacker and you want to hide in this system, you have quite a statistical chance to, well, be missed in the sampling, basically. Uh, but it's sort of hard to catch, uh, if you know sampling theory. Um, so it is an even way less amount of data, um, because you now, in the case of the, the latter case, we would get something in the vicinity of like 500,000 flows a second, which is way more manageable than the two million I mentioned just now. Um, it's also lower overhead on the router because they don't have to com well, compile all these call record details all the time anymore. Uh, but it is a much higher overhead on the collector again, but fortunately it has to do less uh, because the protocol is a bit bloated. Uh, and of course you might just miss, as I just mentioned, what you were actually looking for. So to take all that flow technology where you're collecting packets, you then have IP addresses, but IP addresses don't always say anything. Uh, so there was a very smart guy, Florian Weimer, here in Germany actually, at bfk.de, I think, and he came up with an idea of just logging the DNS questions and answers. And because uh, if you do this in like an ISP network, um, then I will see if you type www.google.com and it goes to uh, address uh, 1234, I will have the mapping between what the name you typed, because a web server can of course host like a thousand virtual hosts, and I will just have the IP address of it. This way, by combining the information of passive DNS with the IP addresses, you have a much better overview of what is actually going on and what real resource the person is using. You still don't have the URL, which is, of course, in the HTTP level, but you will have a lot more information with this. And um, normally, uh, people would try to AXFR domains. Uh, anybody doesn't know what AXFR is, I guess? Yeah, there's at least a couple. So AXFR allows you to, if the permission is set and available, to download, say, um, every host name that is available under um, ccc.de. And for some people, this would be information leakage. Uh, but in this case, you don't care because you don't need to download it because these are the hosts that are actually being actively used, which 
is the ones you're looking for. Uh, this is also, for that matter, a really nice method uh, for finding new bot, uh, uh, botnet outbreaks. Because if there's a new domain name which is being queried suddenly by like a million people, then you know, well, hey, it's new, it's fresh, but suddenly a lot of people are accessing it. What's up with it? And you can look into it. And 90% of the time, it was a domain name which was registered somewhere in China or Russia and is distributing malware. Um, so there are all kinds of uses for these kind of protocols. Um, so as I mentioned before, these um, protocols and these tools are being used normally for billing, but you can abuse them uh, for well, tracing abuse and for solving abuse and for recording abuse. Um, a lot of uh, police investigations and other such organizations are requesting these data daily from ISPs, and uh, quite a number of ISPs cooperate in this, actually, I have to admit. Um, but of course, they can be abused for other things, because if you actually want to track, and that's probably what you were here for, um, people, what they are actually doing on the internet, you can combine this information, as you just mentioned. You have basically the call records, uh, if I have your phone log, your phone bill, I also know who your friends are. Um, as you probably know, there's a friend of ours who is in the U.S. and when he moved into the U.S. the last time, he nicely got detained, got his phones taken, and so on. And basically every person who was in his address book had the same procedure app applied to him. So in the same way, if you have the call details of what IP communications you did in the last, well, year or so on, and you can correlate this together with the DNS system. You know what sites people are using, and you can build up a very nice profile. Um, so normally, um, you probably know about this system from the EFF, where they dis demonstrate that your browser has a unique signature. Of course, on the uh, flow level, you do not have this information because we do not look into the HTTP headers, for instance. And of course, if you do TLS, which you should be using, you cannot get this information out of those packets. So what we have here is um, a new way to do this. We call it sort of digital profiling. Um, you need large amounts of hardware to properly do this. But what you can do is you can, well, keep the call records for a person and check what services you're accessing. So you would think that, well, I go to Facebook and like 10 million other people do this, or 100 billion, how many are in the world who use this stupid thing? And you have Twitter, Gmail, and everything else. So you might think you're anonymous because you're just one of millions. But that's not the only signature your computer is giving off. The moment you turn it on, it will connect to Windows Update. It will connect to Adobe Update, fortunately. It will connect to all kinds of other services. If you're a gamer, it will probably connect to the gaming service once in a while. You will start playing WoW. You will do Farmville. You will do all kinds of things which give a huge signature based which is seeable on the IP level, and of course, because you're going to look up the DNS name first, because most things are based on DNS, you will actually leave these fingerprints behind, and it's very easy for our tool to build up a profile of a single user, and then tell, well, um, you now move your laptop somewhere else, you even change your IP address, but you're still connecting to the same services. Like, for in my case, I have my own mail server, like probably a lot of people here, your mail server probably has its own IP. You're maybe one out of 10 users on the thing. So by just connecting to your mail server, you're leaving a trace of evidence that you are that person. If you, for instance, uh, well, in the cookie case, if you clean your cookies, you're the one man out who is cleaning your cookies because the rest of the world doesn't care about this. <laughs> And in the same way, if you're here at CCC at the Congress and you connect to the network, most very likely you will be using a VPN tool to get out of this network so that what you're doing here is not being seen because most likely you go to a web page which, well, doesn't do crypto because they almost never do. And then you will just, well, be showing off and people can sniff your packets. Uh, like MSN used to always have simply clear text passwords. ICQ at the same issue. And I haven't seen this at a conference in a while now, but at like well, a couple years back, at like, well, ITF meetings, right meetings, they generally post password lists on the last day on the, on the Beamer. Uh, well, usernames, passwords, and that sort of thing, and then you will know what protocols are vulnerable again and which are not using any encryption. 
So, but with this combination, we can build up this profile and we can tell, even if you move around and change your IP address, what, who you are. Well, not so much who you are, but that you're the same person that you were before. It's the same with, well, Google is, has this amazing amount of information because every website you visit has Google Ads on it. Thus, they see every time your IP connecting to Google Ads, they know what you're looking for, also on other web services which are not owned by them, which is why Google Ads is not always a good thing, in my opinion. Um, so, we set up this little experiment here um, with Fraps, who's sitting here in the corner. Thank you very much, Fraps. And um, so, up there, next to where the lights are, there's the, well, the routing room or the switching gear and all the network gears up there. And I took along a W510 uh, Lenovo laptop, which fortunately has like eight cores in it, so that's nice uh, for a laptop. It was heavy as heck, but um, I love my X60. And so we put it up there, we connect to the, uh, to the Force 10, which is the main router, which provides all the connectivity from here from the Congress to the network, or well, the internet. And, but we had a couple of restrictions, which makes doing what I just described quite difficult. First of all, um, my manager, or my department manager at IBM, he was sort of worried because IBM talking at a CCC conference, in the capacity that we work in, because we are in a network security group, and they do also research on, well, uh, uh, the Java cards, passports, all kinds of other things, is a bit of a legal issue. So we had to sign up a legal contract between CCC and IBM, so that we basically put down nicely that we are not storing any information, so that if there is a government agency coming, for instance, a US government information, uh, well, probably most people here saw Nick's talk about this gag order and so on. If you're a US company, the US government can always request any kind of information you have, even if it's coming from a foreign country. Thus, therefore, we had to do this. So I, we didn't store any information on the disk. Uh, there's only a, like a five gig disk in there anyway, which we will be throwing away and wiping for, for certainty. And we were anonymizing IP addresses. Because the anonymization routine takes like a 32-bit IPv4 address and then mixes and mashes it up and puts it in 16 bits, there's not much I can tell anymore because I don't have a reference to the DNS. I cannot map even Google.com to it, um, which is annoying, so I was not able to see so much. Uh, the other thing is that with S-Flow, as I mentioned before, you're sampling. So you get one out of 4,000 packets, so you miss a lot of them. And you interpolate the sampling rate times the number of packets. And yeah, so unfortunately I was not able to do all the nice tricks we just did. Um, it would probably also be not very moral. Um, but I have some nice graphs, uh, which we did get out of this. And as you can see, oh, well, I don't have my walking mic. Um, the red stuff is, of course, IPv4, unicast. So this was 96% um, of the traffic here in the network. And we fortunately had 3.12% IPv6 traffic, which is quite a lot, guys. <laughs> and, and as you can see, the, uh, the yellow or the green part, or the yellow part is, uh, no, sorry, the, the pink part is even multicast v4. And of course, we see some multicast v6 because if you know IPv6, you do your neighbor discovery and everything else with IPv6, your router advertisements. So probably picked up quite a, much, uh, quite a lot of that. So this is packets. And as you can see, uh, these four stands are pretty cool because they did 1.2 million packets per second at certain peak points there. Um, do I have? Oh, I didn't fold it open. Um, and octet-wise, uh, as you can see, we almost filled up the 10 gig link a couple of times in the last day, because this is the last day, by the way. Well, you see the time at the top. Um, so we almost filled up the 10 gig link a couple of times. So I would say, as it is only five gigs normally, that people didn't do their best in filling it up. <laughs> but that would be me. Um, Protocol-wise, uh, it's, of course, uh, obvious again. People use TCP, uh, because BitTorrent, uh, which is probably the, the, the primary protocol being used here at the moment. Uh, next to the FTP is, of course, uh, TCP-based. Um, and UDP was second. So in this last day, so between that period, this was 31, almost 32 terabytes of traffic for just TCP. And 
In the total, it was something like 40 terabytes. So that's quite a bit. So to come back to this whole view, um, the thing is, primarily, if you're able to put an eye, like what we did here, we put a laptop next to the router, we get the data from it, we see basically everything that goes on, well, one out of 4,000 packets, which goes out to the internet and comes back in. This allows us to really well see, especially if you would have NetFlow, we have every record, what people are doing. And you have to realize that every ISP on this planet who has a proper business case and wants to grow in the future has tools like this in place for primarily accounting. But if they're storing the data, you might have a case where some government agency comes and requests this data and they will be able to provide it. This will give them a full call record of what you have been doing in the last couple of months because they also have the IP to username mapping which they're required to store. So even though a TAP law is in place in most countries where they have to have a federal order or a judge to sign off on it, this already gives them enough opportunity to request this information. Thus, my very simple conclusion is this. If you want to be sort of anonymous on the internet, be a sheep. Do not actually clear your cookies. Because if you clear your cookies, for instance, you're the same as everybody, or, well, you are special. If you use a VPN tool, you are special. And that way, you cannot hide amongst the masses. And this is something, well, everybody who knows Tor, the moment you're starting to use Tor, you're connecting to an exit list. You become special because the exit lists are known. And thus, for, for me, uh, because I work in research, uh, it is a very important subject to find out new protocols and new ways to basically circumvent what I've done on the other side, in effect, for detecting these kind of things and behaviors to see what we can do to make the internet more anonymous and that you are not totally subject to certain government organizations being able, or other organizations, which we do not know that maybe exist, to look into what you're doing on the street. Has anybody seen uh, a Turkish lady on Thursday with a nice video with the blocks? Or not? The, she had a really nice video. She was going to update it. And it was on like yesterday or the day before. She had a video about a city where everybody was anonymous. And because, well, I have long red hair, i very noticeable when I walk around the streets. And her, their point was this, that you basically would have to walk in a cube. Everybody has to walk the same speed. Everybody has to, walk, uh, well, exit their houses at the same time. Um, you have to be exactly the same as other people. The moment that you're going to walk your dog, though, you have to put the dog in a cube or in your cube to take him along. In the same way, if you act out of tone with what other people's behaviors are on the internet, it's very easy to track what you're doing on the internet. So that concludes my talk. I don't know what time it is because that thing is weird and broken. Um, is there any... <laughs> Um, if you have any questions for this presentation, you can queue up uh, over here and over here. Um, so it looks like we have our first question. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, do you have any information about this uh, passive uh, DNS? How much overhead uh, this creates? Uh, basically, if every provider in the world would use it, would they just uh, get all the DNS queries from other providers, or is this uh, not an issue? Um, so sharing information is something that you generally do not do because it's a business case. Uh, but I am aware of several uh, well, groupings of people, several communities, where sharing of DNS data is happening, but primarily for hunting down abusive behavior like botnets and that sort of things, uh, spammers and everybody else. Does that answer your question? I was actually more interested in uh, the amount of traffic. If, if oh, the, the amount. The, the, no, if the result of, of these uh, lookups mm -hmm. would uh, have an influence on other providers, uh, exact same lookups. Because with every DNS lookup that you do for your tool, you might create uh, another lookup in, in another uh, provider's 
Okay, uh, you misunderstood what the point of passive DNS is. What you do with passive DNS is you capture the packet, so the query and the answer. You thus don't have to do a lookup, you just store what is the contents of the packets. So okay. there is no extra overhead. The overhead is the database, which is a very fun thing to write because if you get like a million DNS queries per second at a root server, for instance, then, well, you need to store them somewhere, which is the interesting part for doing research on. <laughs> Um, if I could interrupt for just one oh. second, out of out of courtesy to the speaker and those especially who are watching the streams at home, if you could just be quiet, now's not talking time. We'll get to talking time soon, I promise. <laughs> but just shh, just try to be as quiet as you can. If you're exiting, please leave through whatever door is closest to you, and uh, we're going to go to the next question over there. Thank you. Okay, first, uh, this is a question for clarification. Yeah. I think one of your points was that um, since the providers are currently co collecting this information, um, law enforcement or maybe someone else could afterwards maybe look at the data. Um, did I get you right there? Uh, the correct. The following question is, do you actually know of any internet service provider who keeps the um, source IP address like more than two hours b before statistical stuff is happening because I do know um, some providers, I work in a similar field and um, regarding NetFlow, it's still a lot of data and usually what they do, the customers inside the companies mm -hmm. are usually, like you said, for accounting and also planning and stuff like that. They are not interested in individual IPs and it's far too expensive for them to have setups um, where they lock individual IPs for longer time than they have for the uh, than they absolutely need mm -hmm. to for calculations. Do you know of any? Um, there are various ISPs around this world who store information indefinitely. And uh, there are a couple of ISPs who have similar systems to that nice tool you see here in the picture that I wrote. Um, which are very, very um, high performance and are able to handle very high quantities of data. And as I mentioned, well, uh, well, I work for IBM and stuff, so we have the storage capabilities also if we needed to. If you take a company like Google, guess what they're doing with your packets and the amount of storage they have. At least that's my assumption. We should discuss but later yes. on. <laughs> uh, people keep it longer than two hours, definitely, uh, because primarily, NetFlow is used for two things, or SFlow for that matter. It's for accounting, that's one. Then you probably don't need to know the IP addresses unless you're going to do stuff like uh, dividing up your information, like uh, routing strategies that you do, uh, load balancing between two transit providers, or knowing like I need to peer with this guy and so on. If you go into that sort of stuff, you want to know the IP addresses or at least the prefixes or ASNs. But if you are going to look for security issues, you're keeping the information because if you have a virus, let's say uh, you come in the office on uh, Friday and um, you hear that there was a virus and it has been running around your network for the last uh, week. Now what you can do is you can go back for that whole week of data and figure out at least all the hosts in your network which were contacted by the host that you know is infected now, which can make you, well, lower the amount of hosts that you have to investigate for inf uh, for infection. Yes, but see, usually that's only inside a company network, not yeah, for, for an internet okay, service no. provider with millions of flows. Uh, yes, uh, but people store. They store. How, how much is a two terabyte disk? Divided yeah, by 50 bytes per, per record. And then throw some gzip over it or something. Bzip too. I was Compressors just asking because perfectly. I haven't seen it ever okay. before. I, I've seen it, okay. I can tell you. <laughs> A question from the chat. Oh. Um, how much money does it cost for a potential attacker or ISP to maintain such methods of network profiling? Uh, well, your storage, and you need to have somebody who provides you with a nice tool. Uh, uh, I'm not a sales guy. Uh, I don't wear a shirt, you see. Uh, uh, for, for clarification, uh, IBM research is quite different from IBM thing. That's also why I can do the talk here. Um, because the suits would not be allowed to. 
<laughs> la, la, la. Uh, yeah. uh, but yes, uh, there are systems. Um, if you want an open source solution, oh, uh, wait, let's not be commercial here. Um, if you want to see what a system like NetFlow can do, there are various tools which are open source and freely available. Um, good ones are NFSEN from the guys at Switch in Switzerland, actually. Um, you have uh, NTOP from Lucaderi in Italy, um, which generally you can just up get install and you will get them. You will get a pretty nice user interface, everything, and you will be able to see and collect information. And you, maybe you should run this at home. I run this thing at my home because then I can sort of see what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting. And uh, maybe you should try this out. You will then have a much better understanding than I will ever be able to explain in a slide set of, well, what was it, 30 slides with pictures. Okay. okay. Um, talking about a user who is roaming between different computers, uh, different accounts, uh, different mm -hmm. countries maybe, uh, you said it's possible to gather evidence on the identity of the user. Is it really evidence and, or, or, or is it just some kind of hint? Has it, it, has it been used as evidence somewhere? No, it's not evidence, it's a fingerprint. So it's, a, it's primarily a hint. And the big question is of course, like, if you do not have that eye in all the networks that the person you are, well, targeting is visiting, you will not see what he's doing. Unless, of course, you're monitoring the host where his mail server is, for instance. If you have visibility, the eye at his mail server or some other system, you can track him around the world. You don't have to look inside the packets, of course, because you don't care. It's probably like one out of five users on the box. And like, for me, if you want to track me, it's sort of easy. You just look which conference I go to and that sort of things, and you know where I was. You know, it's a similar thing. So you know that if I am now in Germany and you were monitoring like my mail server, then you will know, well, that IP address was definitely me and not some other guy who might also be using my mail server. See what I mean? Um, do you have any data how sheep behave? <laughs> <laughs> well, we are lazy. Yes. We need to simulate. Okay, this. so we have a, a very, a very cool PhD student at our lab at the moment, although unfortunately he's going to Watson. Um, so he did an anomaly detection program, and so what you do is, well, it's, it's trending of, of yeah, behavior. Uh, what you do, what kind of places you hit, and everything else. Um, Google for anomaly detection, NetFlow, or something like Flocon, F-L-O-C-O-N. You will find a lot of information there about these techniques and how they work internally. Does it, yeah, okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for making us aware of this uh, fingerprinting problem. Um, but on the other hand, I'm a bit, uh, well, confused that you're basically, you, you, your advice was we should not delete cookies, we should uh, not, uh, I don't know, use Tor or something like that, oh, which I think is a bad advice. No, no, um, no, 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 no. So maybe I got you wrong there. Yes, you got me wrong in a bit. Um, you're right in what you state. Um, I partially would advise that people do not use certain anonymity programs because it leaves such a high fingerprint. If you solely use Tor, for instance, people will, you will stand out like a red flag. Mm -hmm. And like the same way, if you go to Google and every time your cookie is gone, they know you're you because your IP address doesn't change so much. As a great example, at our lab, so we are like with 300 people, we sit behind one IPv4 NAT address. If I Google for something, I always get the correct answer. Even if I remove my cookies or I change them with somebody else, they know who you are from the amount of fingerprinting information you can do. This gives you quite limited fingerprinting because on, on well, you have only IP addresses, you don't have packet information. Uh, like, well, everybody knows uh, FOP probably, or the POF, P-O-F, or P-0-F. Uh, you, you get the OS information almost, what version of operating system you're using, uh, based on the packet information. And so making fingerprints, especially if you have access to the packet level or if you're on the side of the web server or whatever service you're connecting to, is so easy. And by standing out. So you're basically advising depends on what not you to hide. use, you're not advised, you're advising not to use uh, such like Tor all the time, but let's say if, if uh, I have to choose between, well, uh, using Tor and getting fingerprinted and uh, not using Tor and leaving evidence to me, then uh, you would still say using Tor is the better option, right? Uh, of course, but if you want to use Tor, for instance, VPN to a host 
that is far away from you, which cannot be directly related to you, and then Tor. Or, well, that's actually what you're doing with Tor. You're relaying all over the place. But do not connect to a known Tor exit. Use a bridge. Okay, thank you. Hello, um, thank you for your talk. Can you please tell us something about the current state of all this being done on IPv6, oh. including law enforcement? Oh, <laughs> uh, IPv6 questions. I don't answer the, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I assume people know who I am and what I do with IPv6 or not. No? Okay, good. So uh, current, IP, current status of IPv6 and law enforcement. Um, well, there's this little country called China, and um, um, China has this great Chinese firewall, and maybe I should not say it too loud, but they do not understand IPv6 yet, which is great. Um, <laughs> so you might know about this little project I have called Six Access in my spare time, and uh, we run this service where you can just uh, type uh, www.google.com or New York Times or CNN.sixaxis.org. If you are in a Chinese university, you are connected to what is called CERNet2 or what you in Germany call DFN, uh, so the Deutsche Forschungs Network. And um, CERNet is actually pretty special because CERNet is one of the first large networks in the world who was converted to V6. And as such, they do not do V4. And thus, they have v6 connectivity worldwide, but a lot of websites are not IPv6 enabled yet. So through that service that I run, I see a lot of people looking for that four-letter word with the zero in the middle somewhere that I mentioned before from a certain Asian region because they cannot exit it over the v4, apparently. So yeah, it happens. But from a law enforcement point of view, um, I think it's in the same ballpark as v4 because the same tools are being used. As I mentioned, like Netflow version 5 uh, used to be the common denominator. It was really used by almost everybody. But because of v6, um, the networks which are upgrading to v6 generally also start deploying Netflow v9 uh, because then you have v6 capabilities. And most tools, they don't care about v4 or v6. Like this tool, it's the same thing for it. Uh, it handles v4, v6, and vice versa. It's an IP address. What version it is, it's just more bits. So tools are out there. Um, I know of various government agencies who definitely also are very interested in it, probably have deployed it. So yes, it's being monitored too, of course. But probably less, I have to admit. And of course, in most cases, people will get a tunnel from some lo location. And you will yeah, be sort of anonymous through the tunnel because you will see protocol 41 or port 5072, and that's it. Does that answer the question? Or you want more deep? Okay, mostly. Okay. Oh, privacy. Oh, from a privacy perspective. Okay. So, uh, as you might know, uh, IPv6 addresses 128 bits. The last 64 bits are generally derived from EUI 64 ad uh, address, which is actually derived from your EUI 48 address, which is what most people call a MAC address. So, my laptop over here, if I plug it into the network, will have the last 64 bits as I have at work or if I have at home. So, if I connect to a site, you automatically give off your signature based on your MAC address. Um, now, there is a option for v6, which is enabled per default for that matter on Windows. It is uh, disabled per default on Linux and everything else because, in my opinion, it's a ridiculous option, um, which then scrambles the last 64 bits, gives you a random address, basically per connection. It's RFC 3041. Um, you can look it up. It's pretty nice. But I think it's useless because instead of looking at the full 128 bits, you just look at the slash 48 where the person comes from. And I still know who we are. So it doesn't make a difference. Uh, you said you, we need to find a way to get an empty to the masses. But uh, do you have any pointers on which infrastructure to use to reach that goal while really staying in the realm of uh, client server technology? Uh, things like Freenet are not really the thing. Uh, offering the functionality we want to use. But. Uh, you mean that you keep end-to-end -end connectivity but by staying anonymous or well, what, is, what are the requirements? Not allowing to fingerprint. Uh, really uh, 
not being able to fingerprint something is nearly impossible because you're an individual person. Uh, you do different things than I do. I go to different websites uh, or less websites than other people. Uh, I Google for different things. Um, there are so many aspects that are different between every single person. And in a way, it's a good thing. Uh, the big question actually more is in that case, what are you hiding from? Then um, maybe better described how, how to become a sheep. Uh, how to become a sheep? I honestly can't answer. It's difficult. Uh, uh, look at your 16-year-old sister or something and see what she does. But it still doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> because she will go to other websites that you have interest for and, and here, if you're sitting in this room or we're here at the Congress, you probably have quite a big difference of, of understanding than the 90, well, everybody outside of the building on what interests you have. I mean, otherwise you would not be here. So you will stand out and I don't think there's much you can do about this. Um, Not with the current infrastructure, but no. with what pointers? Uh, are there any ideas on how um, to create such? Probably maybe the opposite answer to the other question is then use Tor everywhere. Because then you have a mixed network and you can solve things. Um, in the Freehaven uh, Anon bibliography, you will find a lot of documents about these kind of discussions if you want to look into it. Hello. Um, regarding the DNS mapping, is it correct that it only works on the first uh, stub resolver? Because mm. uh, all other uh, DNS servers uh, in the chain will not see the, the whole name. Um, yes and no. Um, it depends where you put your eye. Um, that is basically the question. Uh, but if you send a query and the caching DNS resolver you're asking, the question to, doesn't know the answer, it will forward the full question to, well, the server above it, to dot, to root servers. So if you are an operator at a root server and you monitor this, you will get full queries for at least most of the first, well, the first question you will get fully. So it would, would not work uh, to install the own name server on the laptop? Uh, the own name server on the laptop can work, but as I mentioned, if you're an ISP and you want to do this passive DNS stuff and there are various people doing this for the purpose of security, not for tracking people, um, be clear about that. Uh, they're good guys uh, from my perspective. They, uh, they simply take the transit link to their, or well, yeah, the links at the internet exchange or whatever, their exit egress points on the network. They don't care so much about who is actually requesting that host name. They're collecting the information of the mapping from the name to the IP or which records are being requested. Because if you have an anomaly in that data, you can then determine, well, it's probably a virus, there's something new coming up and so on. Um, which is how several botnets have been caught recently. Um, one advice for the audience, uh, yes. just use small providers. They don't have the power and or the intention to monitor all your stuff. Mm, but you do know the picture I had here that small provider is maybe sitting, uh, well, on the left, but then those two little clouds in the middle have an eye, or you see the middle cloud in the, in the middle? A small provider uses a transit provider. If that transit provider is monitoring, it doesn't make a difference. The only traffic that they will not catch then is the traffic in the cloud at the small provider. Or the connection to other transit providers. Or that. It depends on where you put your eye. That's, that's the big thing. What, where, you, where you look. I look now here. I see all these people. Thank you very much. And I see this. I don't see what is happening outside now. That is the bit of the question. Unless I ask somebody who is outside what is happening there. Or I install a camera outside so I can see. Although you have anonymized the IP addresses you have collected, um, can you give us um, an insight on the uh, kind of distribution of destination IP addresses you have seen during the last day? So, where, for example, was there a very low number uh, that was um, accessed uh, very often, or how was the distribution in general? Do you mean, oh, that, that kind of distribution? I can't give you this because what happens is we got the, well, so you saw the V5 packet as a, as a good example. Uh, we use SFlow, but so you have the IPv4 source address 
And what happens is the moment that I copied it out of the packet, or well, out of the packet, the anonymization routine kicked in, and it was scrambled and it was gone. So even for something simple that Frops wanted me to do, uh, looking up the ASN based on the BGP table that we have, I couldn't do this because the information was already gone. Um, which is unfortunate in a way because then we would have been able to show how many people are using Google, watching YouTube all the time because they have a single ASN, which is very nice to show. Unfortunately, the information is not there anymore because it's anonymous. So um, I don't have it, sorry. It would have been interesting, uh, but it's not possible with this audience to do this. I don't think it's uh, responsible to do this. Given that we're um, almost out of IPv4 addresses, or we are out, depending on where it is, um, and the ISPs are probably going to be starting to resort to ISP-wide NAT uh, mm -hmm. of various levels, can you talk about how that will affect a lot of what uh, you're, you've been discussing? And Because it's almost starting to sound like it might be a good thing because it'll scramble a lot of data, but in other ways it might not be because it'll be more localized, so. Okay, so what you should do is this. You go home, you install a Linux box, or you take the one that you already have, or whatever operating system you like, install this tool called POF, P-O-F. It's really awesome. Uh, what it does, it's basically NMAP, but in line. So you get, when you get, well, you, you do a TCP session, it, sort of takes the characteristics that they know that a certain operating system has and it can tell you which operating system it has. Even though you're sitting behind a NAT, for instance, because the packets and the characteristics are different for every machine almost. You have an IP ID in there. There are various other mechanisms where you will be unique even behind a NAT. So the case will not be different when we move to V6. It will just move because now we have a NAT at home because, well, the ISPs don't want to give more than one IP address unless you pay them insane amounts of money. So the NAT will just move a layer up. The bigger issue with that NAT actually becomes for our nice little PlayStation 3s and the Xboxes because you will not be able to easily use the UPnP protocol to actually set up a session with your friend and to slaughter him in some nice game. Um, but from a, from a fingerprinting perspective, there will be no difference almost. Um, because the ISP will just put the I before the NAT also, that they have, probably. I can't, I can't give the answer, but like moving the I around, depending on where your site wants to be, you can collect more or less information, of course. I think I have two minutes left because the clock was fixed. So we're perfectly on time. Check. Are there any other questions? In that case, give Yeroon a huge round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>